hello everyone who's tuning into the Mysterious Bookshops event tonight with William Boyle. Uh, we'll be getting started in just a couple minutes, but we just wanted to, you know, give you a moment to hear the sound of our voices, uh, you know, bring your attention back from folding laundry or doing the dishes. Uh, and like I said, we'll get it started in just a moment for our event with William Boyle for Shoot the Moonlight Out. And it's too bad. Uh, so William is in Mississippi. Uh, I'm here in the basement of the bookstore, which uh, I didn't realize the camera angle was going to reveal quite all the clutter. So this is not my desk. So I don't take too much responsibility for it. Um, all right. Well, I see we just wanted to give it that moment that uh, for people to uh, to tune in. But I see we've got some some views. So uh, my name is Tom Wickersham for the Mysterious Bookshop, and tonight it's my pleasure to talk to William Boyle for his latest novel. We're going to have signed copies very soon, Shoot the Moonlight Out. Uh, you can pre-order now on our website, and we have it in person if you're just dying to read it now, but again, we will have signed copies momentarily. Uh, William Boyle is originally from Brooklyn, New York. His novels include Grave's End, um, as well as um, The Lonely Witness, a Friend is a Gift You Give Yourself, and City of Margins. And uh, just tell us a little bit about what, just, you know, you don't need to give a full plot synopsis, but in your own words, uh, how would you introduce people to shoot uh, the moonlight out? Sure. Uh, thanks Thanks for having me, Tom, and I appreciate it. It's good, good seeing you, good talking to you, and uh, thanks to anybody who's tuning in. Um, so, yeah, this, this novel is... Um, set in southern brooklyn and um predominantly in june of 2001 uh the, the prologue takes place a few years before that in the in 1996. um it is kind of a big sprawling cast uh ensemble cast just you know these these lives kind of crashing together um in pre 9 11 southern brooklyn um uh, you know, there's a, a a young character named Bobby Santavasco who the the book opens with, who's kind of a he's he's a kid when the book opens. I can't remember how old exactly, twelve or twelve or thirteen or thereabouts. Um, and he makes a um, does kind of a dumb dumb kid thing to do, and uh, it, it winds up having uh, bad consequences and kind of snowballs. Um, out of control and and the book really um, is takes off from there in terms of you know everybody uh, all the other main characters being connected in some way to to this event um, or you know peripherally to this event and just these characters kind of crossing paths and getting mixed up together now I know that you've never shied away from your books being classified as crime fiction, but in many ways they're more just naturalistic um, slice of life. You know, there's there's rarely there might be you know sometimes almost borderline cartoonishly over the top mobsters or you know, but larger than life characters who feel like they could be you know truth is stranger than fiction strange. Um, but your your books certainly don't fit into what you would find in the mystery section of your average library. Uh, was this the only type of book that you sort of know how to write or did you make a concerted effort to write these more naturalistic, you know, what could just as comfortably, you know, be filed away as literary fiction, not to get into the whole genre debate, uh, as opposed to say a straight ahead, you know, whodunit or thriller? Um, yeah, I mean, I think probably a little, a little bit both. I mean, I think it's kind of, uh, even though I have, far ranging tastes. I think ultimately it's kind of what I respond to the most as a fan. And so it was kind of where I, where I landed when I, when I started figuring out how to tell the stories I wanted to tell. Um, I also think it, you know, kind of fits in with just the, the way I fell in love with stories that there's a, a blend of kind of the real and also the, the mythological or the, 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 the kind of outlandish even um, that comes often with, you know, neighborhood legends and, and stuff, stuff like that. Um, you know, I, so I, I, I kind of, I, I guess it was a little, a little bit of both of those things ultimately. 
who are some of the the writers or the stories that inspired the the way that you decided to write? Oh man, well you know just just a, a wide range of people. I don't know if a lot of them will will make sense or if they ultimately translate. Um, I mean, definitely both both writers and and filmmakers probably on some level. But uh, you know, I love William Kennedy. He's a he's a huge um, writing hero of mine. Uh, I love Willie Blotton. Willie Blotton's books have had a big impact on me. Um, of course, Megan Abbott's books. Um, so I, yeah, I could I could go on and on listing listing writers um, who've had had some major impact on the way I, I, I kind of like telling stories and and respond to to stories. Uh, filmmakers definitely Robert Altman and Alan Rudolph um, were probably two um, two big ones for me, and especially in terms of structure and, and kind of intersecting stories um, that opened up a lot to me. John Cassavetes is a hero of mine. You know, I think that's that's something that shows up in, in a lot of those, you know, in a lot of a lot of ways in my books. Um, his film Gloria in particular, which is kind of, uh, you know, kind of a crime film, but also kind of not a crime film. Um, so I think th there's just lots of lots of examples like that kind of across the spectrum. But I also love, you know, I love classic crime writers like David Goodis and Charles Williford and Jim Thompson that I think we're always kind of crossing those lines too. Well, and, and also crossing the lines from crime fiction or noir sometimes into just, just straight tragedy. Yeah. Which is, you know, again, of a lot of yours, it's, um, there's, there's the noir that has the sort of deliciously dark twist. And then there's the very human noir where it's just a real person who has come to a bad end. And a lot of your characters start from pretty a pretty disadvantaged position and aren't necessarily um, improving themselves by the end of the story. Is that something that, how much of that is a character device for noir or how much of that is actually an impression of you know, when you were growing up, what you felt like that neighbor, where that neighborhood was headed and how you experienced it. Uh, yeah, well, I think a lot of it, I mean, you know, coming back to David Goodis, I think that was one of the things I responded to most about his work when I first encountered it. Um, and definitely a kind of place that I, I started. Um, I, I've just always, I think, always been interested in, in, um, stories about desperate people kind of you know people whose whose dreams have have been destroyed in some way and are, are kind of lost in a drift um and so yeah i mean i think there's there's probably a lot of of me and my perceptions of the world that kind of show up and and the characters like that um it never felt like just you know it never felt like a device i wanted to utilize it just felt like the stuff i was interested in and the, the characters i was interested in were the ones who were on the ropes who were kind of on the margins who were you know had failed uh, or who had been kind of cornered in some way how long have you lived in mississippi oh geez uh a long time now almost 13 years i think 13 years something like that I mean, so that that predates at least the publication of your first novel. I don't know when you started writing it, but was was there something where you had to leave Brooklyn to write about it? Or, yeah. yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh no, no, no. That's yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I I I, I kind of don't have anything to to compare it to, really. I mean, um, because I did leave Brooklyn because I you know I was chasing something down here and, and speaking of writers who have a big impact on me larry brown is another one um, who i failed to mention you know and larry i fell in love with his books in uh, 2001 when i was living in uh, austin texas and i just kind of i saw the film big bad love and i went immediately to the bookstore and bought that book and read everything by larry brown i could find and that's kind of, you know, a reason, a major reason why Oxford was on, on the map for me and why I wanted to get down here. Um, but I, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't, ultimately, I don't have anything to compare it to. I know that all I know is that I've only written successfully about Brooklyn and about New York while, while away from it. I mean, I was writing New York stories all throughout my 
20s and, and early 30s before I moved here and um, none of them worked or, or they, you know, whatever, whatever happened with them, they didn't, it might have just been that I wasn't there yet, but um, none of them, none of them, you know, none of them were finished. None of them were, uh, were good enough. And so everything I've, everything I've done, uh, everything I've published pretty much has been while I've been here. So yeah, I guess I did need to get away. I mean, or or well, I did, and it happened that way. So I, I you know, I think, I think I did. I I'm not positive if it's an exact quote, and obviously I'm, you know, paraphrasing it now. But I want to say that Chester Himes wrote, I believe, all of or most of the the Harlem detective novels while well, living in Paris, and sort of admitted that that Harlem was a creation of his imagination. Yeah. Do you consider your novels? I mean, do you can they feel very naturalistic and real, but do you consider yourself inspired by Brooklyn as sort of this imaginary place? But I, I you know, I know that you come to New York regularly or at least did into the past couple of years, or or do you see this as you depicting, you know, the real Brooklyn that you knew? No, I absolutely see it as a Brooklyn of my imagination. I mean, I think there, there are uh, for sure real elements and there's a lot of you know, I'm, I'm often bringing a lot of um, people and places and just experiences um, from from the real version of Brooklyn that I grew up in. But ultimately, I, I think it's um, I think it's a, a Brooklyn of my my imagination. And um, you know, that's that, that also comes back to, you know, thinking about how much Alan Rudolph's movies have meant to me, you know, the, the the Los Angeles of his, his films has really kind of inspired the the Brooklyn of my my books. I think in that you know it, it is it is there are elements of reality there, but it's also kind of kind of highly stylized and and goes goes beyond beyond reality. I think um, or you know I, I try not to worry about um, the bounds of reality. What are Alan Rudolph's films? I'm not sure I know that name. Uh, he, well, he was uh, he was Robert Altman's protege. He worked on a lot of the Altman movies in the '70s, and he made um, "Remember My Name" and uh, "Trouble in Mind" and um, uh, "Love at Large" and a bunch of a bunch of really kind of big, sprawling ensemble um, ensemble movies. Mrs. Parker and the Vicious Circle, um, the Moderns, uh, and I'm forgetting. Choose me is Choose me is a big one. I know I'm forgetting a bunch, um, but he he's somebody who's whose works really, really, um, you know, hit me at kind of a impressionable time. Uh, and I'm, I'm not talking about early on, even I'm talking about fairly recently in terms of, uh, you know, understanding structure and how I wanted to tell stories, uh, even his last film, which he didn't make a film for a long time. And then he in 2017 made a film called uh, Ramey Tellen that I really loved that not a lot of people loved, but it was kind of indicative of everything I, I love about his his um, his movies. It's, I'm embarrassed to admit I, I still that didn't re you, usually uh, the gaps in my viewing are at least I've heard of them, but uh, this is completely new to me, so I, I'll I'll note it. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, he's he's. Uh, I think I think you'll like some of his stuff. He's some of his stuff maybe not so much, but um, I think you'll respond to some of it. Now, would you ever write a book set anywhere else? Have you ever been tempted to write a Mississippi book? Um, not really. I mean, I've had a couple of ideas. I think that um, that uh, yeah, I, I've at least edged up against, but um, nothing, nothing that I've been serious about really. Um, you know, I think, and I think if I if I ever if I did at least any time in the, the near future, it'd have to be some kind of like my cousin Vinny situation, like a mm -hmm. Brooklyn guy stumbling into the South. Um, but, but I don't, I don't see myself doing that anytime soon. I've got a, I got a few other ideas in mind and they're all, they're all pretty much right now in New York in the you know, 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. Is, is the reason Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I guess I think Graves End was contemporary, or I read the first paperback version of it. But I, I, I feel like you've done period pieces before, as this one is. Or you know, or let's put it this way: 
the you know the Gravesend, the Bay Ridge, the South Brook, and the you depict seems stuck in time in your books. Where if there is a reference to the internet or anything, uh, it's it's certainly you know in uh, Shoot the Moonlight Out, you have references to people just starting to get cell phones um, yeah. in two thousand one. Is that something where it's uh, again because you know the place, or is it also that you prefer to have some of those some of those rules where you can play in a sort of a more established sandbox without needing to worry about say current technology and yeah 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 no I mean I think it's uh, it's probably that's kind of a nice you know side effect of it but I'm not usually thinking about that it's because that's that's kind of the the, the version of it that I know best in my mind and when I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking about it mostly as it, as it was. Um, so yeah, Graves, Gravesend was set in 2010. I wrote I wrote it around 2011, 12 originally, or the, the first draft of it anyway. Um, the Lonely Witness was set 2017. And then after that, I started going back. Friend is a Gift was 2006 and City of Margins was um, the 90s. Um, so I think I just realized after the Lonely Witness, I realized, even though I'm back home, often, uh, I realized that I was still in my mind kind of writing about it as I knew it and not necessarily as it was um, anymore, because it, it's changed. It's changed so much. Um, and I, I tried to account for that in the Lonely Witness and even, you, you know, and stay focused on kind of the dying enclave within the changing neighborhood. Um, but I think, you know, I think I realized that that was kind of a, a one-time thing I was going to do. And that, you know, after that, I was going to have to dip back into the past and, and kind of stay there. Um, so, I mean, I, I pretty much have, have committed myself to you know, sticking with the eighties and the nineties, I think for, for a little while anyway. Well, I always enjoy seeing the uh, the references to the the music and films of the era uh, when they're sprinkled in. Yeah, um, it was such a it was such a formative time for me because I you know especially the '90s, um, which City of Margins was set in the '90s. This book begins in the '90s and ends and, and you know the bulk of it takes place in June, 2001, which to me is kind of you know at least feels like the end of the '90s in some way. Um, you know, feels like certainly the end of an era. And um, so it's such a formative era for me because I come into the 90s at, you know, 12 and, and I'm, I'm 21 or 22 at the end of the 90s. So everything I'm discovering in terms of music and, and films and books um, is is kind of shaking my, my world up. Now, shoot the moonlight out includes multiple, uh, you know, writers or, you know, aspirational artists, filmmakers, storytellers, including a writer's group. And uh, I was curious, first of all, if you've ever taught and if uh, any of that was based on your experience, but also um, it's certainly, it's a, it's an, it's a very interesting device for connecting these characters and uh, their desires to, you know, tell their stories, uh, brings them together in unexpected ways. Um, but then there's, did you see that also as a commentary on either your own past or how you view, you know, I, I suppose there, there is something in, in that you could have been in that church writers group yeah. at one point in your life. Yeah, you know, I mean, my, my friend, uh, my friend Jack at, at the Square Books event on Monday asked me about that because, you, you know, he um, he said, you know, the the kind of one of the one of the things they tell you in writing classes is don't don't write about writers, and um, I always, you know, I always take stuff like that as kind of a challenge if I yeah. ever encounter somebody telling me what not to do, um, and and I think I, you know, I kind of liked that idea for this book. To, and also to have multiple characters. You have Lily, who's Lily, who's a writer. Um, her her girlfriend, like in the book, Ray, who's a writer. Amelia, Jack's daughter, who um, who passes away, is a wants to be a writer. Francesca is um, the the character that Bobby 
um, the troubled self-destructive kid that I mentioned gets involved with is a, wants to be a filmmaker. Her father was an artist. So it's kind of littered with, littered with people um, who are artists in some way or who want to be artists. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think I was, I think I was thinking a lot about just kind of, um, I, I mean, I guess I'm interested in, in people at a certain point with that. Um, you know, people who are struggling, people who are trying to figure out their identity as artists or trying to, you know, figure out how to be artists. Um, and so I liked, I liked that element. I liked being able to put some of my own, certainly some of my own struggles and experiences and struggles and experiences of other people I've known um, into, into those characters. Uh, I have, I have taught, I've taught for a while now. I, I'm, I, 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 mostly you know i taught as a grad student certainly and then i was a substitute teacher i taught high school for a little bit i've been teaching uh, i've been an adjunct at a university for many years now um and so i do you know i don't i don't often teach creative writing i've, I've taught it a handful of times and i've done some online workshops and stuff um, but i did i tried to have a little fun fun with that and I do think the book on some level, or there are at least elements of it that I hope are kind of um, comic. And, you know, I think that was one of the ways that I, I tried to really have fun with it and, and um, almost, you know, parody it a little bit. One thing, you know, when you say have, have fun with it, um they can still be quite terrifying and vicious, but one thing that I've always liked about your books is that the villains are never, they're first of all, never cardboard. You always tend to uh, give a fair amount of, you know, close third person from, from almost any, every character's, any meaningful character's perspective. Um, but there's, they're never, uh, they're never either just outright evil or even, for the most part, as far as I'm thinking back to all of your books, terribly successful in their villainy, and that they always tend to be almost as if, uh, you know, the, the good characters, they're on the fringes, they're sort of just trying to get by or prove themselves. And, um, you know, I guess it's, uh, you know, so some of that you've explained, but I'm curious if that is, again, informed by anything that you might have seen actually growing up in Brooklyn, or if that is just the type of character you're drawn to. So even the bad guys, you know, have crappy offices or, you know, are hoping that they can, you know, or they're not happy where they are in their career in the mafia and hoping that they can, you know, move up a rank and impress their boss. And, um, but I, I, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to think of books of other books where, uh, the villain is either not a stone cold psycho or some sort of omnipresent evil who's dispatching hitmen. I mean, they're basically almost all on the same playing field as far as desperation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think that's just something again. I've always kind of responded to as a as a fan, as a reader, as a viewer. I like I like you know good characters who can do who can do bad things and bad characters who are, do good things. And I think City of Margins, my last book, was especially kind of built on that idea. Um, you know, I, had, I remember being in uh, an English class in high school where, um, you know, it was kind of, it was like an honors English class. And there were, there were the, a lot of the kids I've gotten to be friends with who were artists and musicians and writers who kind of the, the, the smart kids and, you know, they, they, um, they had kind of turned the tables on a couple of other guys in the class who were kind of more like um, meathead guys who, I don't know why they were in that class. Maybe it wasn't an honors class. I can't remember, but they, you know, my, and I remember them kind of making fun of these guys and it was, you know, after years of the other, these other guys kind of bullying them. And my teacher in that class, Mr. McClarty saying, you know, you, something like you can make fun of them all you want, but they're going to be the ones to stop and help your mom when she breaks down on the side of the highway. And it was, it was kind of this, you know, moment that, that haunted me uh, and really kind of the moment that informed um, city of margins, 
the most where I, I kind of open with that, you know, that character, Donnie doing that, um, you know, doing, doing something bad in the first chapter. And then the next time you see him, he's, he's being a good Samaritan. Um, so I think I've always just kind of liked that, that idea and that you, you're still, you know, even the, even the bad guy, um, is kind of, kind of, you know, just thinking about the, the dreams he had that didn't work out or is, is, you know, thinking about all the things that went wrong and kind of haunted by regrets and, and um, the things that, that kind of shaped him. Yeah. And, you know, it's tough. I realized, um, I feel like we haven't actually talked too much specifically about shoot the moonlight out, but it is a bit of a, a slow burn where, um, it's not that there's nothing about it that I have questions, but I, I feel like it is a, you know, even the prime, you didn't even mention what happens in the prologue. So I feel like we shouldn't give too much away. I don't know how deliberate that was. Um, but, you know, it certainly has for those who haven't read it and only came out this week. Um, I don't mean to imply that it's only about uh, writers meeting at a church and there's a terrible tragedy. I mean, it has a low level mafia figures and a bag full of cash and drugs and, you know, there's suspense and these great characters, but it is something where, uh, you know, I think that was sort of my first question where you, you chose to write a very deliberate place and character based novel where you get enveloped in the world and these people as the action slowly involve, you know, slowly develops before you get to a head. Um, so again, I, I apologize for not, you know, just making it about the book, but in a way, I would just encourage everyone to, you know, read the book and discover it for themselves. Right. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm really terrible at kind of uh, summing things up, especially in these last couple of books, because I don't have a good. You know, I don't. I mean, I feel like with a friend as a gift, you give yourself. Maybe even the Lonely Witness. I had a little bit of kind of a a line I could I could say about each of those. Whereas these last two, because they're a little bit more sprawling. Um, character driven ensemble things you know i i've i've not i'm not as good at at, <laughs> at summing them up quickly or you know but that opening yeah, the opening that i didn't mention that wasn't really deliberate i'm just not i'm not good at that uh, but the character bobby is, winds up him and his friend zeke go down by the the belt parkway and they they're throwing rocks at cars getting off um off the parkway and they they wind up um you know, getting one through an open window and striking a driver, which leads to a fatal, fatal accident. And that's the, that's the kind of tragedy that opens up the world of the story. And that gave me, um, I had a, a friend who, when I went over to his house one day, he kept throwing snowballs at cars and hitting them. And we were on sort of a, a ledge over his garage. And I didn't want to do it because I was a bad pig. You know, I didn't want to do that. And then, of course, he, you know, encouraged me to join in. And the first one I threw nailed the driver's side window. I immediately screeched to a stop, ran out and yelled at us and I was incredibly terrified and apologetic. It's where I never would do anything like that again. I never did. Yeah. Well, that's and that's yeah. where the book starts for me, actually, because that's uh, it's based on when I was a kid, I was 11 or 12, we went down to the Bell Park, we went down to this, this same spot in, in, in the book. And uh, we, we went to the Wendy's across the street and filled up all these little plastic containers of ketchup and mustard and mayonnaise and, and stood there and hurled them at cars. And, um, and this is actually in the book. Uh, we, you know, the, the guy who wound up being an off-duty cop kind of screeched to a halt, got out, chased us and yelled at us. And that was the end of it for me. But um, I think I, I think I was always like, you know, I, I, I often do this. I go back to moments like that and kind of think about if I was a different kid or if things if things went a different way, what it, what would it have been like? And um, so, you know, even though nothing happened that day, uh, and I, I'd learned or learned my lesson. I, I was haunt, I was kind of haunted by that that moment, and and you know had always thought about starting a story with that. And uh, that was where this began with, you know, I, I just had these, these characters down there um, doing that. And it, they graduated from mustard and ketchup to, uh, to rocks.
Now, is there, you know, as you say, your last couple of books, it's hard to sort of do the, the one line elevator pitch. Have you ever been tempted to, you know, say, write your equivalent of the uh, Westlake of his Richard Stark books? You know, do you, do you have any sort of, um, you know, high, high concept or like sort of more straight ahead thriller or crime novel that, that would deviate from your style, but, you know, you think it would be fun to write? No, not really. I mean, I've had a couple of ideas, I think, that I thought were maybe sort of like that. And then I think, you know, when I start writing, I'm just kind of the writer that I am. And, and, I, and I, I go back to, to the things that I like to do. And, and yeah. so I think ultimately everything kind of um, turns into the, just the kind of story that I like to tell. And I'm talking even even the the couple of failed things that I've begun that I thought were maybe maybe a little bit more in that direction. Um, they, they, I didn't see them through because they didn't work for other reasons, but uh, yeah, I, I kind of started steering back into just telling them the way I tell stories. Mm -hmm. So at a certain point, if Ace Atkins stops writing Robert B. Parker, <laughs> you don't want to pick it up? I don't think I can do that. I mean, I think there are, yeah, I don't think that, well, number one, I, I, honestly, I'm, I'm ashamed to say this, but uh, Ace knows it, so I could say it. I've never read any Robert B. Parker, so I couldn't, I definitely couldn't do that. But um, I, uh, I, yeah, no, I, I think there, there are maybe, you know, I don't think there's anything like that that I could do. Maybe I could do some Sopranos fan fiction or something, you know, all right. Polly Walnuts and, uh, and new paltz for the day that's that's something i could do but i don't think i could do any of that it's funny i, I didn't actually have a, a articulated question and i didn't want to just crudely say your books sometimes remind me of the sopranos but of course i was <laughs> i was thinking about that reading this one you know and there was just the film and i don't know if you know that there's a new oral history that just came out but i feel you know even more so and actually when this one is set which is you know the the Sopranos is often sort of lauded for showing the, the sort of de demystified sort of mundaneness uh, and small timeness of organized crime. And I, I actually do think that there's, um, you know, a considerable uh, crossover, if not, you know, direct inspiration in the kind of characters, the kind of mobsters who will pop up in your books uh, seem, you know, like they're not the kind of mobsters you see in much fiction. But in The Sopranos, or if you read a lot of, you know, organized crime, true fiction or reporting, seem much more true to life. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I had a huge, I mean, I've been rewatching it. I've had, it, I've had it on the brain this month because I, obviously I watched the film, The Many Saints of Newark, and I've been rewatching the show again. And yeah, it had a huge, huge impact on me, not just in terms of that stuff, but also because it's a, you know, it, it's hilarious, um, yeah. which is something it doesn't maybe get enough credit for. Um, and it's also um, so much about family. And, you know, I mean, these are these are definitely ways that it's uh, it's influenced me. And, you know, growing up um, in an Italian American family, as, as I did, you know, despite my last name, I, which is Scottish, my dad is Scottish, but my mom's Italian and I, I grew up only with the Italian side of my family. So I think the thing I responded to most about The Sopranos when I first saw it was that it was a great work about Italian American families. And, you know, and um, and I certainly also growing up in Bensonhurst and Gravesend in the 80s and 90s, I was kind of totally wrapped up in um, mob, mob legends and, you know, just read about that stuff pretty obsessively. Um, so I liked it obviously on that level too. And I also like, you know, I loved from an early age, I loved, you know, gangster movies, especially the, the early stuff like the public enemy and, um, little Caesar Scarface. Um, and I liked the way that it messed with those, those kind of, um, you know, classic ideas of, of the gangster story. Um, so yeah, it had a, it's it had and, and continues to have a huge, huge impact on me. It's funny what, what you said about it being funny. And I'm actually in the middle of rewatching it too with my girlfriend. And she said that in the past she couldn't stand Livia. And now every yeah. time she's on screen, she's just laughing hysterically at her awfulness. I mean, there's, yeah. 
think there is oh, something to it also where the first viewing you, you can be very tense not knowing when the violence is coming not knowing what sort of terrible thing is going to happen but in a way having a little bit of comfortability with the overall arc of the story uh, there's a lot to appreciate that uh, I'm, I'm not sure I, I quite caught the first time yeah no I, and I love yeah I love her she's incredible and just gets that kind of like I mean I'm sure I'm sure other other folks connect with it on that level but that kind of just that, that martyr um, martyr quality she has she just nails it i mean you know um it's just so so funny um and uncle junior is is always a really funny character too i think now when, when you mentioned so first of all i just put it in the uh comments but if anyone has any questions feel free to uh to type them in now and we'll get to questions in a little bit um i, I am curious did you ever you know, as a, a kid saying they're interested in um, organized crime, you know, I, I would never, I think, like take a like a mafia tour or something that always seems a little ghoulish <laughs> to me. But I mean, did you ever walk by the Gemini Lounge? Did, did you were you aware of people in your neighborhood who actually were uh, involved? Yeah, no, I mean, I did. I definitely. Well, number one, I I grew up in an apartment uh, with my mom where the previous the previous tenant in that apartment was Anthony Gaspipe Casso. Oh, sure. So um, I kind of grew up with that that in the air, just hearing stories on the block about about him, and and you know, really just only ever, hilariously, only ever people saying great stuff about him, mm -hmm. um, you know, because he would just like give them gifts off the back of a truck or whatever, you yeah. know. Um, so I, I definitely grew up with that kind of sense of wonder like you know whoa what did he what happened in this apartment what, what did, i wonder if anything ever happened here uh, beyond that i think mostly mostly my the extent of my interest in, in actually going to places was just more like coney island i think I, I spent a lot of time because i was kind of obsessed and, and still am obsessed with coney island and the history of coney island um you know i think i i i, I would go and like try to see what I could of the old Coney Island and, you know, where, where guys like, you know, like where kid twist, babe, kid twist Rellis was, was mm -hmm. thrown out of a, thro thrown out of a window. If I could, you know, see anything or, or even be around anything like that in Coney Island, I, I enjoyed that, but I didn't go much, much uh, deeper than that. Mostly I just liked reading and hearing and listening to people talk about that stuff. I think they, I think there were technically some other excuses, but for uh, viewers who don't know, Gaspet Casso, who was decided to collaborate with the federal government and was so horrible, they realized they couldn't use him as a witness. So, and then he felt betrayed. And there's some quote, um, there's a Philip Harlow book who, you know, I, I sometimes maybe slightly dubious journalism and purple prose, but uh, Gaspet actually talked to him and, in terms of, there's something where it's, you know, in all my years at the mafia, I've never dealt with, you know, crooks like the federal government. He already felt so betrayed because they decided that someone who had, was a mafia serial killer who wouldn't make a good witness and basically uh, didn't give him a, the deal he wanted. Philip Carlo, you know, grew, uh, was, I, I grew up next door to him. Oh. Um, well, he, he was well, older than me. He was neighbors, yeah. Yeah, he was older than me, so he was gone. Uh, he was gone by the time I was a kid, but he, uh, his parents still lived next door to me growing up, and he would come back. So he was really, he was my first idea of a writer because he would yeah. come back, and you know, he had. I think uh, I remember his. I think it was his first book. He wrote a book called Stolen Flower that like Robert De Niro had optioned, and, and then he started writing all those true crime kind of massive true crime books. Um, but yeah, he, his book on gas pipe, there's actually a, there's a, the address is wrong, but there's a, a picture of the apartment where I, I grew up. Well, I mean, that makes perfect sense. I remember from that book, it's, I think one of the reasons gas pipe collaborated with him is because they were, they were neighbors, you know? Yeah. 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 And I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to besmirch Mr. Carlo. Uh, and I, no, I, no, I mean, I've I read know. all those mafia books, but yeah, I mean, you know, the Iceman one is pretty dubious, you know, there's just some things, but yeah. I'm yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I'm with you. I'm with you on that. I, you know, I think that um, I'm not. I'm not like offended. <laughs> Don't worry about that. 
Well, I doubted it, but I felt bad that I publicly said on this now recorded video because I, I <laughs> enjoyed his books. You know, I just think maybe he was a little, uh, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and so uh, we we do have viewers, just in case you're afraid that you've been talking to the void and this will live on as a recording on our Facebook page and YouTube. So far, no one has uh, typed in any questions. I mean, by all means, please, please do. You know, we'll, we'll keep going for a few minutes, but we'd love to hear from from the audience if anyone uh, does have a question for William Boyle. Um, but, you know, I'll sort of one of one that I have to ask because I'm both curious and I'm sure the viewers are too, is uh, what have you read and watched recently? Uh, I know you're also a, a big movie fan that you've been enjoying, inspirational, underrated, doesn't new, old, anything that's just on top of your mind? Yeah, well, uh, reading wise, I've been, I've been really totally consumed the last week or so by uh, the Paul Auster biography of Stephen Crane that just came out um, last week. Um, yeah, I love, I, I was a huge Paul Auster fan for a long time. I kind of drifted away from his books at a certain point, um, but I, I was really excited when I heard about this and, um, and I, I love Stephen Crane. I mean, he was, he was, you know, one of the first writers I really responded to as a kid when I when I read the Red Badge of Courage. Um, and, and this is like, you know, it's a massive book. It's kind of a, a this great act of, of literary obsession. Um, and I've, I've just been really enjoying that. Um, I also, uh, uh, Alison Galen's new book, The Collective, I, I really loved. Um, and, you know, watching, I've, I've been, mostly I've been, uh, I, I, during the pandemic, especially, I was watching just a, just a ton of movies. Um, I've kind of fallen off a little bit more lately, and especially because I've been this month rewatching The Sopranos, so I haven't watched a ton a ton of films. Um, I rewatched Red Rock West yesterday for the first time in a long time, um, which I love. Uh, yeah, I'm a big big John Dahl fan, big Nicolas Cage fan. Uh, is, that the, is that the one where there's cocaine in the toilet? That's kind of all I remember. I don't think so. No, I don't remember that. Is Val Kilmer in it? Or I'm thinking no, of no, oh, are you, you're thinking, uh, I don't know which one you're thinking. No, I this is, like, uh, yeah, it's Nick, one of those Nick, movies I can picture the cover and I think I saw it on cable when I was 13 and now I don't yeah, remember. Yeah. yeah. It's Nicholas Cage, um, Lara Flynn Boyle, Dennis Hopper. Um, it's kind of, my friend Jack describes it as, uh, like blood simple meets groundhog day. Okay. It's kind of it's kind of a uh, this western town that Nicholas Cage shows up and keeps trying to get away from, and he keeps getting pulled mm -hmm. back into it, and he's tangled up in this kind of Dennis Hopper's a hitman who's come to town to kill J.T. Walsh's wife, played by Lara Flynn Boyle, and Nicholas Cage gets all wrapped up. And it's John Dahl. It's I think you know uh, I can remember if he made it right before the last seduction. I think it was right before the last seduction. Um, so I, I rewatched that, and today, you know, and last night and today, I rewatched uh, Barbara Loden's Wanda, which is one of my favorite favorite films. Um, as I was talking about it in this in this online workshop I was doing, um, and yeah, that's that's just kind of one of my one of my top ten a, a movie I've returned to a lot the last few years. Have you seen you know speaking of uh, Italian or uh, crime shows? Have you seen Gomorrah? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I have the. I've read the book. I've seen the movie. I haven't watched the show that much. This show is my favorite. You know, it's it doesn't have the family stuff or the humor of the Spanos. It's my favorite crime show ever done. I, I okay, yeah, I need to. I need to get get on that. Get back to it. I think I, I started it at some point, and then I kind of drifted away. But I was into it. Um, it's something that the first couple of episodes seem very conventional. And yeah. there's, there's nothing wrong with them, but it's kind of like I've seen this before. But yeah, yeah, around like three or four, it really kicks into gear, and yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely, I'll definitely watch that. Yeah, I haven't. I mean, there, there hasn't been a ton of a, uh, especially watching rewatching The Sopranos now. I, I'm kind of, I'm less less surprised that I don't watch many shows anymore because it's hard to, it's hard to top that. Um, yeah, yeah I've, I've had it. I really liked. Uh, it's a different kind of show, obviously, but I loved Reservation Dogs this year. That's probably the yeah. the best best show I've seen this year. Yeah, I haven't watched that yet. 
really, really great. The one I've been rewatching, which is uh, kind of like the the trash version of all of those shows, but it's one of my favorites. Did you ever watch Banshee? No, no, I've seen that. I've seen that like pop up, but I've never watched it. I'll check that out too. Again, the first episode, it was Cinemax. The first episode could not be more Cinemax. I always feel a little bit embarrassed recommending it to people, but uh, <laughs> it, like, it really builds into something pretty pretty special and actually pretty, you know, I don't know if I would call it profound, but it, you know, it's there's a lot of there's a lot of fighting and uh, naked women, but it actually really turns into something pretty, uh, yeah. I have to check it out. There's some depth to it, you know. It's kind of about post-traumatic stress syndrome, and there's a lot of cool. <laughs> I mean, there's like a a Salt and Precinct thirteen episode. There's a an oh, nice. episode where it's a heist, but it's all found footage where they were in like head cams. They did a lot of very interesting kind of a uh, stylistic things too. Nice, nice. I'll check it out for sure. Um. So, still, no one has uh, typed in a question. So, I mean, we're I'm happy to you know we can keep chatting for another couple of minutes. Uh, I don't <laughs> yeah. know if you have any. You know, final. Uh, you know, doesn't need to be final like this minute, but you know, again, please chime in. But uh, you know, I, I will just say once again, um, thank you for shoot the moonlight out, and we'll be getting signed copies. That uh, you know, even though he's not visiting New York this time around, um, William was kind enough to allow us to ship books to him, so they will be truly signed on the title page, not tippins or book plates or anything. And we'll have those in a little bit. Uh, I, I guess I am curious. Uh, you know, you don't need to delve into. Um, you know, whatever the personal reasons were, but I always, I haven't spent, you know, I've been to Georgia a couple of times, North Carolina, you know, Florida, a lot for my grandparents. I haven't spent a huge amount of time in the South, but I've always had a real affinity for Southern writers. Um, and I know that Oxford has something of, um, you know, a, a writer's community where, I mean, not necessarily all the writers there are, you know, it's also it's a college and not all the writers there are, you know, strictly speaking, what you would call quote unquote Southern writers, of course, yourself included. Um, yeah. But I wonder if, if that's something, you know, like Chris Offit, I'm a huge fan of, but, you know, going way back, I you know, always loved Harry Cruz and all these other, you know, um, when obviously Flannery O'Connor or Faulkner or anything. But um, yeah, growing up in the Northeast myself, that's always been... Uh, an area where I don't know exactly what the connection is beyond just great writing, but it's been a draw. And I wonder if that's something that either brought you there or uh, how your appreciation or understanding of that has expanded since you've been living in Mississippi. Yeah, no, I mean, it was the total reason I came here. Um, you know, I knew, as I think I said before, I loved, I loved Larry Brown's books. And that was kind of one reason that Oxford was on my map. Um, I also loved um, uh, kind of North Mississippi Hill Country Blues stuff that, that I, I discovered in college that was coming out of here, R.L. Burnside, Junior Kimbrough, Team Model Ford, stuff like that. But, but uh, I also, you know, pretty, pretty early on um, got heavily into writers who like Harry Cruz and Larry Brown and, and also Faulkner and Connor O'Connor and Carson McCullers and William Gay and you know just a lot of a lot of writers like that who uh, were, were you know quote unquote southern writers um, but just you know just you know great writers but I think for me a lot of them uh, wrote about the places that they were from the places that they lived or uh, grew up in ways that I wanted to write about New York and, and maybe I wasn't seeing that so much in kind of northeastern Contem especially contemporary kind of fiction set in, in New York and, and New York City and, and in Brooklyn. I mean, you know, most of most of the Brooklyn fiction I responded to was Depression era or, you know, or from certainly pre pre um, my era. Um, so, yeah, that drew me down here. And then Oxford. Yeah, it's, a, it's just a great I mean, it's a great literary town, you know, beginning with cloth there, of course. Um, you know, Square Books is one of the great independent bookstores in the country. Um, there are so many writers who live here who are, are great. Chris, who you mentioned, Ace Atkins, Tom Franklin, Mary Miller, um, 
Melissa Ginsburg, uh, you know, the list, the list goes on, Michael Ferris Smith, um, the list goes on and on. I mean, it's just such a great place to be, you know, it's a, it's a bubble of, of, um, culture, certainly in a, in a, uh, in a area where there's not otherwise a, a ton in that regard. Um, and, you know, pre COVID, especially, I mean, you know, is the, the town is kind of built around the bookstore. There's four mm -hmm. square books has four stores on the square. Um, you know, every, every week, um, you know, or a few times a week, there are events there. I mean, you know, we're, we're maybe hopefully getting back to a place where that'll be true again sometime in the near future. But, um, that was a, a big draw for me staying here. One of the things certainly that's, that's kept me here. And, um, you know, there's also kind of a, a, a warmth, uh, an intimacy to events like that here that, that I certainly never experienced on the same level in, in New York. You know, just the fact that, you know, I would go probably, if I went to a reading here, I'd go out to the bar afterwards with the writer and, you know, just, and, and um, that was probably, you know, my experience anyway, growing up, um, that was less likely to, to happen in New York where, you know, maybe the writer would be kind of drifting away with their agent or their editor who was in, you know, whatever. Um, but here it was just kind of, you know, it was, the, it was just kind of more immediate. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's weird in, in a lot of ways, it's weird to, to have been here for so long and to be so fully in, in, in my mind and on the page dedicated to, home uh dedicated to new york but um there's a lot of stuff here that that definitely feeds me creatively another writer who i was just introduced to and i actually i think that i got the book arrived i don't know yesterday or the day before i might have first name wrong i know last name's pancake dj pancake oh yeah Bruce dj pancake yeah he's one of yeah. my favorites yeah okay All yeah right. well, he, I, well, I he uh there. He, uh, you know, there's not many stories. Um, there's that new Library of America edition of his, his collection. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's just like, uh, you know, there's, there's this, the, the one book of stories that he published. And I think there's a couple of uncollected stories and some letters and fragments and stuff like that. But he was, yeah, he was a writer who I encountered probably in my early twenties who, um, West, West Virginia writer who I, uh, who just blew me away still. Yeah, still one of my one of my favorites. That that book um, is incredible. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, so Andreas answered the call for audience uh, Q and A. I know you touched on it a little bit. What are you reading at the moment? Any book of the year so far? But uh, you know, to answer our audience question, if you have if you have one one or two more titles you want to throw out, and then I think we'll. we'll oh man, up. well yeah, so many. I mean, I've read I've read a lot of good stuff this year. I mean. Uh, I'm, I'm very lucky that uh, I've gotten, you know, to be good friends with uh, so many of my heroes. And so Megan, Megan's book, The Turnout, is certainly one of my favorite books of the year. Ace's most recent, Quinn, Ace Atkins' most recent, Quinn Colson. But uh, my friend Jack Pendarvis wrote a book called Sweet Bananas that I, I really love. Um, and, you know, w Willie Blotton is probably my, my, my favorite contemporary writer and his, uh, his new book, um, the night always comes is is probably my 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 favorite um, book of the year. Um, you know, he's just somebody who continues to. I just love his books so much, and you're probably the writer whose whose books I reread the most and go back to the most, and just kind of you know feel feel the most uh, about uh, you know. And so uh, that that's a it feels like that came out years ago already, but I think it was just earlier this year. Well, thank you so much. Um, if there's no final questions, uh, like I said, I think we will wrap up. You know, I, I've just got to throw out a piece just because I read it. Uh, have you ever read Stephen Hunter? Yeah, Hot Springs. Like you read Hot yeah. Springs? Yeah, Hot Springs, I read that. You probably know him for Shooter. Okay, because the sequel to Hot Springs is one of the most insane books I ever read. And it's about a, a black Mississippi penal farm. Uh, that's basically like Heart of Darkness, you know, in the early oh, 50s, wow. buried in the swamps. And of course, it's, it's got all of his gun porn and stuff. But it was, 
I hadn't read him, I don't know, since I was a teenager or something. And then I, I picked up Hot Springs and read that. And, you know, I, I don't know if you would really call that Southern literature. Yeah. But uh, it was it was definitely one of the most, just speaking of Mississippi books, it was one of the most insane novels I've maybe ever read. Uh, I need to go back. Really I, read that, I read that a long time ago. Hot Springs? Yeah, Hot Springs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, don't, I didn't know about the sequel. I'll, I'll check it out. It's, you know, like I said, page turner, which I don't mean, again, to um, taking anything away from it. I think he would say that, yeah, he, he writes his books to be repulsive. But uh, let's just say it ends with Audie Murphy and other real life inspired figures with oh. Earl attacking a prison in Mississippi. Oh, well, I got it. You know, it's, I'm. I'm uh, that's a I'm I'm kind of obsessed. I've gotten over the last uh three years or so I've gotten obsessed with Audie Murphy, so <laughs> now I've gotta read. I mean gotta he's read a that. major character in this. I, you know, I forget he calls him like Audie Murray or something. You know, he <laughs> changes them just slightly enough to uh protect their reputation. But yeah. Well, okay, I'll check it out. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much. I don't know if there's any, you know, final words, but you know, thank you, Bill. And uh, you know, again, I know I've held it up. A bunch of times, but uh, apparently Bill doesn't have his own copy with him. So uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll remind you all what it looks like. You know, I certainly hope you choose to buy it from us. Uh, like I said, if you walk in the store tomorrow, uh, you know, you, we have copies, but we'll have signed ones soon and we ship worldwide. And uh, yeah, so, so congratulations and thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thanks. In New York. Yeah. Thanks so much, Tom. I appreciate it. it. It was great. Great talking to you. Thanks. Thanks for. Uh, doing this and yeah i'll definitely i'll be back up in probably december so hopefully i'll uh, i'll catch up then well, wonderful well thank you all for tuning in and uh good night take care thanks